Welcome to The Elephant, made with the support of the Climate Kick Alumni Association. The, the alternative to hypocrisy is not moral purity. The alternative to hypocrisy is cynicism. That's my guest today, George Mombio, a journalist and weekly columnist for The Guardian newspaper. He's one of the foremost progressive thinkers in Britain today. In his writings, he takes on a range of social and political topics, but he's probably best known for his work tackling environmental issues. He's authored several books, including Heat, How to Stop the Planet Burning, a 2006 book on climate change. And most recently, he's written Feral, a book where he talks about the potential of rewilding or reintroducing species that have been wiped out from their former habitats. In his columns, Mamio often draws the connections between how the environmental and climate crises we're facing are intimately interconnected with other traits of our society. For example, the enormous concentration of corporate power. It is by far and away the greatest threat to democracy. And because it's a threat to democracy, it's a threat to the survival of human civilization and much of the rest of life on this planet. Or the runaway consumerism that has us gripped. You know, th these are not essential components of human happiness we're talking about here, but they are essential components of economic growth. In our conversation, we also talk about what would happen if governments actually did walk the talk on climate change and why they're so reluctant to do so. This would be basically a straightforward contest for survival between fossil fuel companies and governments, and it's not totally clear to me which one would win. And we also talk about why, in his view, the root cause of climate change goes well beyond capitalism. You know, we say, well, it's this particular system that, that we're in, which is a problem. It's not, it, it's, it's a lot deeper than that. And, and I'm slightly worried that we end up misframing it. That's George Mambio, so let's get right to it. Hey, Kevin. Hi, George? Yes, that's me. How are you doing? Good, and you? Yes, I'm fine. You know, I, I wanted to start off by asking you about The Guardian's campaign, or at least about the, the idea that I think they've really done a great job in spreading in terms of leaving it in the ground, leaving fossil fuels mm -hmm. in the ground as the, the main challenge that we need to do in staving off the climate crisis. Now, I, I thought this was a sort of a, a new way to think about climate change, more or less, like through Bill McKibben and 350.org, the people who've been working on this. I thought it was relatively new, um, but I was surprised to find out when I was researching that uh, you actually first coined this term way back in, in 2007. Can, mm. can you talk to me a bit about how uh, your evolution to that thinking came to be? Because before the focus, I think, of the entire environmental movement was on just individuals reducing their consumption. Yeah. Well, I, I just published a whole book about how to tackle greenhouse gas emissions um, and to get a 90% cut in emissions while maintaining a reasonable quality of life in the developed nations, a book called Heat. And um, it wasn't until a few months after that, in 2007, when I started working with people campaigning against open cast coal mines here in Britain, that it suddenly hit me with tremendous force that we were missing something huge here, something which should have been obvious from the outset, but because of the way the problem was framed, even I, who had just spent three years working on the issue, had completely missed it, which is that we were talking entirely about our consumption of fossil fuels without talking about the production of fossil fuels. And that if you attempt to deal with a problem only at one end, only at the demand end rather than the supply end, you are almost certain to fail because the supply end will continue to undermine the demand end. And this is especially the case with climate change where the measures we deploy to try to reduce our emissions tend to be weak and negotiable, whereas the extraction of fossil fuels from the ground is a hard fact. Um, that is a non-negotiable fact. And when they have been extracted, they will be burnt, regardless of, of what those weak and negotiable measures might say. So unless you restrain the extraction, you are not going to solve the problem. And, and this came to me... Um, when I was sitting on top of an enormous machine, a bunch of us had um, had swarmed into an open cast coal mine, which was just being started. It was going to be uh, the biggest active mine in Britain. It was strongly opposed by local people. 
it was going to make a substantial contribution to undermining our country's own carbon targets. So we decided to try to stop the work. It's in a symbolic way. Obviously, we weren't going to be able to stop the whole operation, but to, to close it down for a day. So you're, you were basically breaking in and trying to get in the way. Yeah, well, we, we climbed onto these huge um, extraction machines um, to stop them from working, which we, we did successfully. And it was sitting on top of one of these things. I was thinking, unless this stops, everything I've just written in my book is a complete waste of time. So why is all the focus on changing light bulbs and having more efficient means of transport and stuff and not on what I'm seeing right here under my feet which is the coal being extracted from the ground in the first place. And so suddenly I, it, it hit me and I wrote this article saying, look, I have the answer. I've found this um, fail-safe means of carbon capture and storage, which is called leaving fossil fuels in the ground. Why do you think, I mean, it's such an obvious point once you actually think about it. And I mean, it seems strange that the, it wasn't framed in those terms in a way. Why, why do you think we, we missed this point earlier? Well, you use the term framed, and you're quite right to do so. And the frames, the mental structures through which we perceive the world, are absolutely crucial in determining the limits of that perception, in, in telling us what is there to be seen and what exists outside the box which is not to be seen. And we talk um, of blind spots, things that we don't see as a society, but we don't really have blind spots. We have tiny vision spots, tiny spots of perception in what is basically darkness and those are the spots where a, a flashlight has been shone on a particular issue and a particular way of looking at that issue and we all focus on that we all look at where the light is and we look at the thing that it illuminates and we fail to see everything that surrounds it i, I guess it's like how a magician's trick works that's exactly it. And, and what magicians are, are so great at is framing, is, is saying, look over here. This is, this is what I want you to see, and this is the way in which I want you to see it. And so we all see it, and we all look without even knowing that we're being induced to do so. And we don't see all the shenanigans which are going on somewhere which is right there in front of us. But we don't see it because of, of what we've been induced to see. And, and this is the way the whole issue was framed from the very beginning of the process. So if you go back to the Rio Earth Summit in 1992, it's all about greenhouse gas emissions and it's not about coal and oil and gas and leaving them in the ground. And, and I think it, it wasn't necessarily with bad intent. I think what had happened was that they were riding on the success of the Montreal Protocol, which dealt with the CFCs and the other chemicals which were damaging the ozone layer and they thought oh well that's a way to go you know we just stop producing those gases and so they said, all right we've got to stop producing greenhouse gases now um, to deal with climate change uh, but of course the thing with CFCs is that by stopping manufacturing the gases you were stopping producing the gases it was kind of all all of one issue but in this case is a two-step process. You dig the fossil fuels out of the ground, then you burn them. And there's two separate processes going on there. And if all we're talking about is the burning of them, we are not going to deal with the issue. One of the, I think, great points you make is comparing this to past struggles that we've had, like slavery or mm -hmm. the arms trade. If we were to try to yeah. you know, solve the international arms trade, not at the producing end, but at the consumption end. Yes, I mean, I mean, I, I, I think I use the example of the biological weapons protocol, uh, which you know prevents states from using weaponized anthrax or smallpox or all of these horrible things which they might otherwise be induced to use, and and if that were to say, there are no restrictions on stockpiling weaponized anthrax and weaponized um, smallpox. It's just that we don't want you to use them. Well, how effective do we think that would be? You know, if you had. 50 states, each with a massive stockpile of these really unpleasant weapons, and you have a situation like Syria at the moment, do you really think they're not going to use them if they've got them? Uh, the only way that, that the protocol is effective is that it forbids both their use and their ownership. It's how it forbids having them in the first place. So it's the production and the consumption which are both banned. You're not allowed to make them, you're not allowed to store them, you're not allowed to use them. 
But in this case, we are allowed to <laughs> we're allowed to dig the fossil fuels out, so we're kind of making them. We are allowed to store them, but we're trying to prevent them being used. It's just not going to work. And if you want a good example of how that sort of thing doesn't work, well, look at the U.S. gun laws. You know, you can you can all have guns. Hey, folks, you can all have guns. Just don't use them. If you use them, you're going to go to prison. Well, if everyone's got guns, they're going to get used. I, I want to come back to kind of the cognitive dissonance that represents in, in a second. But first, I just want to have you comment on something that I, I think was a really big problem with the previous framing, which was that by necessity, if you had any concern at all, even if you did all you could to to reduce your emissions, you were still a hypocrite. You couldn't possibly not be a hypocrite because we still live in the world. We still, you know, function as a, a as a human in Western civilization. I, I saw this one uh, interview you did uh, after the release of your book in 2007. It was on uh, a Canadian public broadcaster in Ontario. And I, the interview was okay, but the, the focus the whole time was on how you had flown there and how, you know, mm. hence... Hence, that was part of the problem. Could you just comment about that? Well, I, I, it's true. It is part of the problem. And, um, and you know, as an advocate um, for climate change measures, I have to make sure that I try to keep my own emissions as low as I possibly can, though, you know, it is very hard. And that means flying no more than once every three years. And that's, you know, that is difficult in my position. But the, the alternative to hypocrisy is not moral purity. The alternative to hypocrisy is cynicism. There, you know, there's two options for human beings. So the one is to, to say, okay, I'm going to aim to be better than I am. And I will fall short. Of course I will fall short because life involves a whole lot of messy compromises and a clash of values. So in that particular case, there were two things fighting each other in my mind. One was I've got a perspective here which I think is really useful and I'm going to want to try to get that out as widely as I possibly can. The other was I shouldn't be flying and traveling as little as possible because of um, what that perspective informs. And so there was an obvious clash there. But the alternative to, to being a hypocrite is being a cynic. It's to say, well, actually, I don't care. You know, I, I recognize these issues. I don't care at all. I'm just going to carry on. Moral purity is not a human condition. We don't have that. We have constantly to struggle with messy compromises in which we're involved. And what we need is an institutional framework which makes that struggle as easy as possible. In other words, which minimizes the, the conflicts. Um, and so, for example, if you have um, in your own country a great train system, um, which allows you to travel from one place to another cheaply and easily with low carbon emissions so that you can leave your car behind, well, straight away, you've managed greatly to reduce a potential conflict. But if you don't have that system, well, you don't have that option. Yeah, and, and it occurs to me, I always think about if it's only up to a few do-gooders or people who are really concerned to solve the problem by by not participating in it, then it seems, well, well of course we'll be doomed because if, it, if the default thing to do is still the wrong thing to do, then it doesn't seem like we'll ever make progress. Well, and of course, the people on the other side, they have no qualms at all about flying all over the world to say climate change is all bunkum, don't listen to these people who are telling telling you that you've got to cut your emissions, um, CO2 is plant food, it's good for the planet, so let's eat, drink and be merry. And, and you know, they're getting out there, they're not going to stop. We have to get out there to contest them. Now, one thing that I think you've made uh, the point very strongly in your articles is is the idea of cognitive dissonance. And there seems to be a lot of cognitive dissonance that surrounds our current thinking, especially around around climate change. Maybe just to start, can you talk about the uh, the curious British example of the uh, the two pieces of legislation uh, mm -hmm. that have uh, vastly different aims? Yes, yes. So the UK was a pioneer in climate change legislation by bringing in the 2008 Climate Change Act, which um, commits us legally to cut our emissions by 80% by 2050. It was a pioneering, um, impressive piece of legislation, in my view, didn't go quite far enough, but you know, it sets a, a benchmark for action, um, which has been followed by other countries around the world. So great, fantastic. We also have now the 2015 Infrastructure Act, which legally commits 
all subsequent governments to do what they call maximize the economic recovery of oil and gas from the United Kingdom's continental shelf. Um, and what that means is to get every last drop, which is economically viable, to get out of the ground. And of course, if you're getting the oil and gas out of the ground, you're going to burn that oil and gas. So on the one hand, we have a legal obligation to minimize the amount of greenhouse gas emissions we produce through burning fossil fuels. And on the other hand, we have a legal obligation to maximize the amount of greenhouse gases we produce by burning fossil fuels. <laughs> uh, and, and somehow these two issues can occupy politicians' heads both at the same time without their heads actually exploding. And the same senior ministers are responsible for both policies, incidentally. It's the same person who has to has to deal with both policies. And they can blithely go through life saying, got to cut emissions, got to cut emissions. We've got to get as much fuel, uh, fossil fuel out of the ground. We've got to do that. And without making any obvious, visible public attempt to reconcile those two positions. The, the piece of legislation saying there's a legal obligation to dig up uh, every last drop. I mean, that, that sounds like a pretty remarkable thing. How did that come about? Well, you see, this is very interesting. It's one of these omnibus bills um, <laughs> pioneered in the United States. Um, it is fantastically undemocratic idea, which is that you get this bill, which is ostensibly about something else. This was the infrastructure bill in, in the UK. And you just start loading it with loads of different unrelated issues. I mean, there was were, there were stuff about native and non-native species in the infrastructure bill. What the heck's that got to do with infrastructure? And, and they threw in just loads and loads and loads of stuff. And then there was one particular controversy in it. I can't even remember what it was. And it comes back to the framing issue. Uh, which everybody was asked to focus on. And it was something which, in my view, was petty and irrelevant. I mean, as I say, it's even slipped, slipped my mind. But everybody would say, oh, look, the Infrastructure Act's got this really worrying thing in it. Everybody should be upset about this. And everybody, including all the politicians who were meant to be debating this and voting on this, they just ignored everything else that was in it. And I, I suspected, because <clears throat> this is unfortunately the way our government often works, that it actually put it out there that, you know, there's this um, controversial thing which we want um, people to focus on um, so that we manage to miss all the other stuff in this act. And and I uh, banged on about it in the media and um, tried to get people to pay attention, but I, I just could not shift public focus on onto, it wasn't just the fossil fuel issue, but that was the biggest one, but onto a whole series of really disturbing things which were contained in this act. And um, and so it went through with almost no debate inside Parliament or outside Parliament. I imagine you obviously must be most uh, familiar with the British example, but would you say this is characteristic of a, a lot of governments, this sort of uh, this divided mind, divided strategy uh, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense? Well, very much so. I and mean, a classic example is President Obama, who, you know, from the climate change point of view is a lot better than his predecessors and probably a lot better than his successors. Um, and uh, within the course of three weeks, he first of all granted final permission for Shell to do exploratory drilling in the Chukchi Sea uh, with horrendous consequences had it found sufficient oil reserves to make it viable for um, exploitation to go ahead. And thank goodness it didn't. Um, and then three weeks later, he pitches up in Anchorage and says, oh, isn't it terrible what's happening to the Arctic? Um, it's all this burning of fossil fuel, which is causing climate change and it's melting the ice and um, the Arctic ecosystem is in serious difficulty as a result. And you think, is this the same man speaking? Can he not see the contradiction between these two policies? It's not exactly subtle. Here we're not talking about a slight nuance in policy between trying to protect the Arctic ecosystem from the impacts of fossil fuel production and allowing fossil fuel production to take place within the Arctic ecosystem. But because of the way these issues are framed within politics and within the media, you can happily sail through life without even acknowledging the contradiction, let alone having to address it. But why do you think that's possible? Like, what is actually going on here? That, like, do you think it's, it stems from 
our own cognitive dissonance that the the majority of us have when it comes to this problem? I, I, partly, but I think also it, it comes back to the framing issue with which we begun. You know, because climate change has been framed as an issue of what we do to minimize our consumption once the fossil fuels have been extracted from the ground, is almost as if the extraction of fossil fuels just occupies a different part of the mind and those two bits of the mind are just not connecting over this issue and they're not, um, they're, there's just no read across. But also, it, it's a test of commitment. I mean, if governments were really serious about climate change, obviously the first thing they would do would be to press for, for fossil fuels to be kept in the ground. But they know that in doing that, they're going to go into head-on confrontation with Exxon, with Shell, with Peabody Coal, with all the huge fossil fuel corporations who are extremely powerful. And I think that could you know, test state power to its very limits and possibly even beyond. Were they to do that, they would find themselves in a huge fight. So instead, and the much easier political approach is to pretend to deal with climate change and, and say, you know, we, we, we want um, vehicles to become more efficient. And actually, we're not going to pursue them that hard if it turns out they've rigged their tests and are pretending to be more efficient than they are. Uh, we want people to have more efficient heating and lighting systems in their homes and offices and all that. And they're just playing with the problem. They're pushing the food around on their plates to pretend they've eaten it. Um, whereas you know, if they were really serious about it, um, they would be taking that huge political gamble of saying, we've got to keep the fossil fuels in the ground. But the, the fact that they're not doing that suggests that actually they're not really serious about dealing with climate change. They're playing at it. They, they want legacy. They don't want people to turn around and say, well, you know, Barack Obama or David Cameron they had the opportunity um, while they were in that position of tremendous power to have stopped this thing, which is now 50 years down the line or whatever, utterly ripping our lives apart. And they failed to do so. They, they don't want to be in that position. They don't want to be seen as being on the wrong side of history. So they've got to play at the issue. They've got to pretend that it's being dealt with, but they don't really want to solve it. Because if they did, they would be taking a completely different approach. That reminds me of a, a line that I read in one of your articles that I really liked. You said that creating silence requires only an instinct for avoiding conflict. Do you think that's going on here? Do you think they're conscious of the fact that if they were to actually take the steps required that they would be attacked? Or do you think it's almost uh, subconscious? I think almost everything that takes place in politics is at least partly subconscious. Um, there, there are instincts for avoidance. So there are um, instincts for taking the easiest, quickest route to doing something. Um, and that route is often about PR and spin rather than actually dealing directly with the problem that they confront. And, and, and in a situation like this, um, if you were directly to name the problem, which is getting fossil fuels out of the ground, and directly to address the problem, the fights we currently see over climate change policy, funded by you know all this sort of astroturfing and and kickback, funded by people like Exxon, uh, they they would be nothing by comparison to to the fights that would happen because this would be basically a straightforward contest for survival between fossil fuel companies and governments, and it's not totally clear to me which one would win. You know, fossil fuel companies are so tremendously powerful. Really, so you 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 think they. Like, if the government really cracked down on them, the fossil fuel industry could win? There are various means of um, making it politically impossible um, for, for governments um, to save um, humanity from its own, from its own destruction. And, and those means include operating through the media to effectively um, make almost anything government does just about impossible. It means... Uh, using your political allies to shut down governmental functions. Uh, 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 these are highly dangerous um, people who are running these organizations and they are ruthless and if cornered, they are desperate. And I, I, I would imagine they would take extreme measures to, um, to protect their sunk costs, to protect the, their share prices, which are dependent on their fossil fuel reserves. 
And so uh, they, they will fight using every dirty tactic that exists. Now, I believe governments should have this fight. I, I believe this fight is essential. This is an existential issue for humankind. But you can quite understand why they want to avoid it. Well, that goes into the, the next topic I wanted to touch on, which is the idea of uh, corporate power more generally. Uh, so I take it that you have the belief that to tackle climate change, we also have to tackle corporate power? Mm. Um, yes, I, I do believe that. And um, we, I mean, corporate power defines the limits of politics at the moment. Um, it defines the limits of political debate and defines the limits of political action. And unless you can effectively confront and face down corporate power, um, it's not just that we lose on climate change, we lose on democracy. And, um, uh, it is by far and away the greatest threat to democracy. It is what turns what should be active functional democracies into nominal hollow democracies. Um, it's what creates the post-democratic situation that we're in where we elect politicians um, and they put legislation through parliament or, or through the House of Representatives. Um, but actually, the real power is elsewhere. And the legislation they're putting through and the way in which they act, that is governed by powers for which we cannot vote. Um, we certainly can't vote them out. Um, and so they go through the form and function of democracy. But because the focus of power has shifted to another forum, um, the changing of the outcomes does not take place through democratic measures. And it's corporate power, which is this great threat, both to democracy and because it's a threat to democracy, it's a threat to the survival of human civilization and much of the rest of life on this planet. I mean, you, you, you said that the focus of power has shifted. So was it always this bad? Was it? Are you suggesting that it was it was better before? And if so, what, what do you see as the the cause of the shift towards corporate power away from governments? Well, th there was a period, um, and in the U.S., you would date it from perhaps the New Deal, nineteen thirty three to maybe nineteen eighty. In the U.K., probably nineteen forty five to nineteen seventy nine. As a period in which government reasserted itself and said, we are here to represent the people, not just a bunch of plutocrats. We, this is meant to be a democracy, not a plutocracy. And, um, and through that reassertion, they regulated corporate power and economic power in such a way that it had to be responsive to the democratic will of the people of those nations. And then we saw the neoliberal revolution kicking in in 1979 in the UK and 1980 in the US, which effectively said we are going to remove those constraints that the economic power, raw economic power, will be unrestrained by effective social, fiscal or environmental regulation. We will stop transferring wealth from rich to poor through taxation and public spending. We will stop the effective regulation of corporations to prevent them from polluting our air and water, from stripping the soil off the land, um, from mistreating their workers, mistreating their suppliers. Um, uh, we will take away the constraints that limit the scope of raw economic power. Um, and, and that process has been continuing ever since. And in, in the UK, Regardless of whether there's a conservative government or a Labour government in place, it's continued pretty well unimpeded. And so we end up now with a wildly different situation to the one we had just 30 years ago, where our power at the ballot box is exceedingly limited. Our leverage is much weaker than it used to be before. We can vote out the right-hand glove puppet or the left-hand glove puppet, but not the, the the corporate powers which are manipulating those puppets. How did this happen? Do you, would you say that, that the public was asleep at the switch, essentially? Was it uh, in slow motion? How how was it able to, to happen seemingly continually for, for such a long time? There were a whole load of reasons for it. Um, and, and one of them is the speed with which 
um, these revolutions take place. And, and the UK at the moment is a very good example of that, where we have this um, extreme austerity agenda being pursued by the government. Uh, and when it took power, this agenda came in so fast and so far and on so many fronts that it simply couldn't be contested. Um, you know, I, I, people like me were struggling to try to defend the regulations preventing pollution and soil erosion, for example, uh, but at the same time seeing a hundred other assaults coming from other angles. And we just had to ignore those because you can't be effective unless you concentrate on one or two things. And there just aren't enough politically active citizens to confront all that at once. And so by the time the battle is over, you're just looking at a scene of carnage where just about everything which I believe are the pillars of civilization, the, the things that make the difference between a decent society and a barbarous one have been pulled down and burnt. And it's, it, it does feel like being on a battlefield after a monumental rout. And all you can see is the armor and the corpses lying around and, and smoke rising from it. And a society which was a functional, civilized society has been reduced to a squalid, sordid place where the rich and the powerful get just what they want and other people have almost no power almost no voice and almost no share of the resources the wealth of that society it sounds a bit like uh what naomi klein would say in the shock doctrine it is i mean her her, her analysis has been invaluable and the way she's demonstrated how um, they use crisis to pursue this agenda um, and they act incredibly fast. So they have a pre-prepared set of policies which are already very carefully mapped out. Um, then use a, a real crisis or precipitate a fake one. And in the UK, we've seen a fake one uh, use, oh, we've got this massive deficit. Everyone must focus on the deficit. Let's frame all of politics as being about um, solving this deficit. Right, but we, we do not have a crippling deficit in this country. We have a large deficit, but many times in history before we've had a larger one. Um, it's by no means, it's perhaps ranked somewhere in the top few hundred political issues, but it's by no means the most important one. But we focus and focus and focus on the deficit and the whole thing has got to be, we've got to cut public spending, cut public spending, cut public spending. And everyone goes along with this. Yes, but what's the best way to cut it rather than saying, why on earth are we doing this? This is madness. We don't need to cut it at all. And in fact, by cutting it, you're going to cripple us economically as well as environmentally, socially and all the rest of it. But the, the, the combination of creating a crisis, exploiting that crisis, doing it with tremendous speed, and very cleverly monopolizing the debate so that everybody sees it through the frame, the crisis frame that you have created. This is a, a critically important aspect of how these things are done. And what do you think about her more recent arguments about, uh, I mean, we've been talking about how corporate power is connected to the climate crisis. What about her thesis that it's, it's even capitalism more generally that Mm. is uh, the direct cause, or at least uh, interactively linked. Yes, well, I'm, I'm partly sympathetic to that, but I think actually a lot of what we face is even deeper, even bigger than capitalism. Oh, that's, that sounds uh, rather daunting already. <laughs> well, well, in, in that you know, the great transformation which has taken place over the past 250 years or so worldwide has been fossil fuels. And regardless of the system which has made use of those fossil fuels, and you could contrast capitalism and communism, for example, the outcome has been catastrophic for the natural world and um, catastrophic for the long-term prosperity of, of, of human beings. Um, in both cases, the tremendous amplification of human endeavour by fossil fuel, which, which has done tremendous things for us, it's, it's delivered many benefits, it's also greatly amplified our capacity to cause harm. And, and almost regardless of what system, um, what political system makes use of that amplification, the result is a war on the natural world. The result is, is a massive destruction of habitats, of wildlife, of um, the Earth's physical systems, the atmosphere, the oceans, um, uh, we, 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 we are destroying the ground on which we stand as a result of fossil fuels. Now, 
it's definitely the case that there are aspects of capitalism, just as there are a aspects of communism, which have particular ways of exacerbating that assault. But the real problem is this, this endless growth, this endless increase in our capacity to lay waste to our surroundings, uh, that we simply have not really taken responsibility for and not really even acknowledged. You know, we say, well, it's this particular system that, that we're in, which is a problem. It's not. It, it's, it's a lot deeper than that. And, and I'm slightly worried that we end up misframing it. Uh, on the idea of endless growth, one of the, I think, really clever things that you've uh, pointed out recently, or it's come up with uh, this hashtag called extreme civilization, mm -hmm. i.e. what is all of this growth and consumption for that we're being told is, is sort of the center of what our economic and political and societal system should should be based around. Can you talk to me a bit about this hashtag and where this came from? Yes. Well, I, I, I launched this hashtag because, you know, one of the things which strikes me is the extraordinary disjunction between the scale of the damage we're inflicting and the absolutely trivial and ridiculous uses to which we're putting that damage. So, you know, governments are very seriously sort of sit down and strike these massive treaties like TTIP and the Trans-Pacific Partnership because, you know, we've, we have to grow the economy and we have to be very serious about this. And they, and be, but because in the rich nations amongst prosperous people who are the major consumers, of course, our needs have already been met, what it ends up with is more and more bizarre and extreme products and services in order to maintain economic growth. So you have Terry the Swearing Turtle, who, um, who, who you know, you'll, you'll prod it and he'll come out with a, a string of expletives. Um, or you'll have um, an iPad stroller now. You, you, you can put your baby in the stroller and there's a slot to put the iPad in, so they can they, they can be looking at the iPad rather than looking around them as as they as they're going along. There's a portable watermelon cooler, um, a great big thing. It's like a it's a fridge. It's a refrigerator on a trolley, um, uh, and the, there's only one thing you can put in because it's got the shape and size to do that, which is a watermelon of a particular size. So you can take it to picnics. Your your portable wa watermelon cooler. And so, are you saying these things aren't essential for human flourishing? You know, um, you could put it like that. Uh, basically, we are creating this explosion of junk, of completely useless, pointless stuff, much of which is designed, incidentally, to be given away at Christmas and, and, and other such occasions, not for anyone to use, but to make people snigger a bit. You know, you give it to someone as a present at an office party and they'll, they'll you know, an inflatable Zimmer frame or something, you know, and they'll laugh at it and then they'll throw it away. It's never going to be used. It's never going to be seen again. It's never going to be displayed even. Uh, you unwrap it, you have a laugh, and then you throw it away. Uh, it's like these electronic greeting cards. You open the greeting card and it plays a tune. Now, now that greeting card has got the equivalent power of software of what launched the moon landings. And, and it's got this confection of complex electronics. You open it up, it plays a tune, gives you the greeting, and then you throw it away. And, you know, th these are not essential components of human happiness we're talking about here, but they are essential components of economic growth. And if economies are going to keep growing, we have to continually find new stuff to consume. And the stuff becomes more and more ridiculous as we go further and further and further in manufacturing needs and wants in order to induce people to keep consuming. There's one thing that's really stuck with me that, that you wrote about a couple times, which is studies that show that it's the people who consume the least in the world, uh, in, in various countries, that uh, on average, are most concerned about their environmental impact. Yes, yes, it's, it's very striking. What we've been constantly told is, oh, you have to get rich to care. You know, you, you, people aren't going to care about the environment until their basic needs have been met, until they've got enough food, shelter and stuff. It, all the surveys show exactly the opposite, that the people who care least are the richest nations, uh, the people of the richest nations, like the United States, like the United Kingdom. We are the ones who care least. The people who care most in all the surveys are the people in the poorest nations, perhaps because they understand the issues more. They're closest 
to, to natural disaster. They can see it happen. They know what happens when natural disasters strike. They care. They see what happens when stuff is dumped in the river, when trees are felled and soil slides down the hill. They, they, they understand things in a way that we've forgotten. I mean, that's my explanation for it. Uh, but also, perhaps, they haven't had the empathy knocked out of them. They haven't had the care, the kindness knocked out of them by this 24-hour, 24-7 crazy consumption treadmill that we're on this hedonic treadmill which just stops us from thinking it stops us from feeling because it's just constantly um coddling us cushioning us in this security blanket of consumption so that we don't engage with our own impacts we don't engage what we're doing to other people we don't engage with what, uh, with what we're doing to, uh, to other places and and the surveys consistently show uh, again and again that it's a total myth that you have to get rich to care. In fact, what, what seems to be very clear from the surveys is that the richer you get, the less you care. That's, that's quite a scary thought. Mm. Well, it is. And, and of course, uh, it's another, it should present another monumental challenge to the notion of economic growth being good for us. You know, beyond a certain point, economic growth destroys our humanity. You know, I, I remember reading uh, a couple of old essays. I think one was by Bertrand Russell saying that, saying in the future, maybe, like because we've met all our basic production uh, standards, we'll have to work much less. Maybe we'll have mm. uh, work only four hours a day or something like that. Um, it, it sounds like those two things are connected. The fact that we're always working and, and producing more by necessity, we'll, we'll consume more. Do you think that if we're actually going to take the steps required, we might end up in a, a future where we have more idle time? Reminds me of the old um, Heinrich Boll story of the fisherman. Um, there's there's a tourist comes up to this beautiful island, and there's a fisherman leaning against a tree. And the tourist says, um, uh, "Hi, what are you doing?" He said, "Oh, I'm just sitting here watching the sunset." And he said, uh, "He said, well, why are you doing that?" He said, "Well, because I've done my fishing. I did a couple of hours fishing today, and um, now I'm just chilling out, kicking back." And the guy said, "Well, you know, if you." If you got out there a few more hours, you know, you could um, earn the money to get a second fishing boat and then you could hire someone to take that boat out and then you could earn even more money and you could get a third one, a fourth one. You, you could build it up. You could get an empire here. You know, if you, if you were working 10 hours a day, not two hours a day, you, you could build yourself an empire. And the guy says, and then what would I do? Oh, anything you like. Kick back, watch the sunset, enjoy yourself. <laughs> And it's a beautiful illustration of the sheer weirdness of the situation that we're in, that um, we keep promising ourselves that there will be a promised land at the end of this, that we will, when, when we've gone far enough through the tunnel, we'll come out into the light and then we'll have all those things which economic growth promised us. And yet somehow it just seems to be elusive and we find ourselves working harder and harder it wasn't just Bertrand Russell, it was Keynes, it was Marx. Many other people predicted that we would hardly spend any time working. But the people who spend no time working, two hours a day, the hunter-gatherers on the whole. And ever since then, we've just worked harder and harder and harder, doing more ridiculous hours and more ridiculous tasks. One idea that I've toyed with that I hope isn't true is, is the idea that we just always want more, though. As humans, we seem to get habituated to whatever our present circumstances is really quickly, which is why you know, happiness doesn't seem to grow after we meet basic uh, levels of, of income and, and security and shelter above a certain point doesn't seem to grow. Um, mm. but, but yet it still seems that we have somewhat of an innate drive to always be seeking more, whether it's more, you know, more success or more um, artistic prowess or like whatever it happens to be, it seems like we have some innate drive for more. Would you, would you say that's true? Yes, I mean, this is the hedonic treadmill you're describing, but I wonder to what extent the way in which it has been framed, to come back to framing once more, and, and, and the way in which more is described to us and explained to us, so it guides the way in which we seek that more. Because there are lots of more things that we can seek without causing harm, in fact, while doing a lot of good. More peace, more, more peace of mind, more engagement with ourselves and with our children, our families, uh, more time in the countryside, more time kayaking with dolphins, more time lying 
in in flowering meadows surrounded by butterflies staring up at the sky. Um, yeah, I want more of all of those. I think probably most other people want more of that sort of thing. Uh, why wouldn't we? Uh, more leisure time, more holidays. Don't we want more of those as well? Uh, but we're channeled into wanting more of a particular thing. And, and so I accept your premise that we are effectively insatiable. Um, I think that is... Uh, a, a human characteristic that we are insatiable but it's insatiable for what and what we're told we should be insatiable for is more money more stuff uh, bigger stuff better stuff and just more 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 actually you know there are many other ways of channeling that insatiability into some really great stuff more learning i want to know more about the world i want to meet more people i want to talk more i want to spend more time thinking as well as more time being and feeling and experiencing beauty and tranquility. And now, you know, all of those are just as powerful as human drives, but of course they can't be packaged up and sold to us, and so no one's got an interest in promoting those and getting us to focus on those aims rather than on the aim of just filling up our lives with totally useless things like Terry the Swearing Turtle. <laughs> Well, it's interesting because you, you, you'd say the, there's two types of, of mores in a way. Like you, you mentioned all those things like tranquility or, or more time kayaking, doing things that we enjoy. It, it seems like there's a big difference, though, because one, one more is attached with ambition and more ambition, and one is attached with being satisfied. Mm, you know, I, I've got a powerful ambition to know more. I, I've got a, a powerful ambition to be a better father. I've got a powerful ambition to be more socially skilled, um, a powerful ambition to, to see more nature, to spend more time with dolphins, to have an even better dolphin experience than, than my best ever dolphin experience. Uh, those are ambitions which it feel to me as if they occupy exactly the same part of my brain as wanting to sell more books, for example. Now, I, I want to come to, we've talked a lot about how the, the situation is, is really bad. There's a lot we're up against, the, the corporate power and just uh, the inertia of the system, our own, the, the way life has been framed to us for the past several generations at the very least. You've talked a bit about how um, hyper-consumerism might be connected to the lack of nature um, mm -hmm. or maybe e ecological satisfaction. And you've also talked about how, while it's important to focus on all these issues and, the, and to focus on what we need to stop, that you also think it's really important to have a sense of, uh, of love almost, or uh, a sense of joy that you're also fighting for at the same time. Can you talk a bit about that? Mm. Y yes, I, I mean, there's a couple of things here. First of all, we have to have a positive vision. If the only thing we have is a critique, um, and is the opposition to the bad stuff that's being done, well, we render ourselves powerless um, because the most we can ever do is to fight the tide. And uh, we might be able to slow it down, but it's going to come. Whereas if we have a positive vision, say here is a better world we could have, an, an accessible, a, a real better world we could have, um, that does two things. First of all, it encourages people to fight the bad stuff because you're trying to get to the good place and you have to get the bad stuff out of the way. And people, are, in my experience, become very frustrated with the bad stuff when they have a vision of something better. Um, that, that's number one. But number two, it um, also keeps you going. It makes it less likely that you're going to burn out, uh, which is absolutely essential if you're going to be an effective campaigner. And without being able to hold that better vision in mind, without being able to see a better life than the one we have at the moment, you're just going to have a nervous breakdown after a while. And I've seen plenty of people end up like that. Plenty of really great campaigners, really trying to make the world a better place, but they just couldn't see the hope anymore and ended up in a really bad state. Well, you know, we've got to have a, a, a vision of a positive environmentalism and a, and a positive political program as well and I've been trying to develop some aspects of that myself too but we've also got to be able to unhook ourselves from the madness of the world and just let go let go of our our frenetic desires and embrace instead um, something much richer and deeper which can only be described as love 
and that's love for each other but also love for the world around us on that point you you've also pointed to research that says you know fear motivates survival and and selfish thinking so it seems to be if we if we get too scared about the state of the environment it could actually backfire that there's there is a real danger that that um you know with all this sort of rhetoric about we've got x number of months to save the planet um we're all going to fry and the rest of it you know none of which might be wholly untrue the the danger is that you fill people with foreboding and the result is a threat response right i'm going to look after myself then I'm going to go into survival mode and to hell with everybody else, to hell with other people's interests, to hell with the long-term survival of the living world. I've just got to look after number one. Um, and you know, this is a well-established psychological phenomenon. This is how people react. Well, it's unsurprising. And, um, and, and people turn rightwards and, and hunker down, raise the drawbridge. Um, it, we've got to really try to avoid provoking that response uh, by saying, look, here are the ways in which we can do stuff and here are the ways in which we can create a better world and it doesn't have to be like this now unfortunately as time goes on it becomes harder and harder to relay that message convincingly because every year is a lost year at the moment you, know, you look at climate change we've been talking about it now for 25 years and there's been no effective progress at all and and it's all promises, promises. You know, well, next year, next year something's going to happen, and um, just just hang on to then, and then you'll see. Oh well, no, it didn't happen this year, but next year it's going to happen. And you know, I've been, I've been an environmental campaigner and journalist now for thirty years, and and I've seen this every single year, this promise being endlessly deferred. So you know, it does knock hope back, and the fear does rise. I I can't pretend otherwise, but we have to find where hope lies, and we have to pursue those hopes. And this is why, for example, I've um, emphasized rewilding so much recently. Right, because it's a way to ha have a sense of, of awe and, and hopefulness for it, as in we could make something better happen? It is a vision of a world that's better than today's rather than just slightly less bad than it would otherwise have been, which is the standard environmental vision and being able to bring back lost habitats, bring back species which are missing from many places, you know, you're not going to repair all the damage we're doing. That's, that's true, but but in some places you can make a radical difference, and I believe that Britain, where I live, is one of those places. But I mean, like you just said, I mean, you've been working on this for thirty years, and things have only really gotten gotten worse. Have Have you struggled at all to walk that line? And have you ever been close to to burnout? Oh yes, of course. Yeah, no, many times. In fact, I'm, I I I made the decision this time around not to go to the Paris climate talks because of the appalling experience I had in Copenhagen where I I just felt so dejected and defeated afterwards that I was I was depressed for two months I could scarcely function for two months after it it was a, it was a really horrible experience and I'm just not putting myself through that again and and there have been plenty of times like that but at the same time because of my contact with nature um, because of the people around me who I love, because of my deep and gripping interest in intellectual questions, um, the stuff I uh, uh, trying to work out every day of my life, trying to get to grips with things to understand them better, all these keep me going and get me up in the morning, usually in a state of great excitement. I wake up thinking, right, I'm going to do this today. And, and, and whether that thing is go to the library and try to pin down those figures which have been troubling me or go out kayaking with dolphins or take my um, three-year-old to the market and um, then go to the cafe with her afterwards whatever one of those things it might be that's an exciting thing which gets me out of bed um, with a spring in my step and so what would you say to those of us concerned about climate change because it seems really hard I mean, you found rewilding, which you're really passionate about and which gives you a lot of, um, you know, kind of hope and, and excitement for the future. But if we're focused on climate change, it seems like that's only something that, that we can talk about in terms of negative and what we need to avoid. Well, there, there are ways and means. And, and one of them we have in the UK, um, something called the Transition Town Movement, which is saying, look, 
you know, let's see the climate change uh, challenge as a positive challenge, a, a challenge to create communities which are going to live much better, where there's going to be much more emphasis on local togetherness and engagement and um, producing our food locally, developing good transport networks, developing effective housing. And this will bring us together as a community and make us function better socially. Um, so it, they've sort of reframed the challenge as a, a challenge to engage with positively rather than a challenge to engage with negatively, to say we can enrich our social lives by taking action on climate. And and that's that's a good way of going at it. You know, as, as we've been talking about, it, it's clear that we need a, a positive, hopeful vision of of the future in order to bring about a transition towards a sustainable future. But of course, it's going to take a lot of resistance too. And and you've shown no shyness in um, in using resistance over the years. Uh, like you just mentioned at the start of the interview, uh, occupying the coal mine. And I was curious, as a young man, I read that you were in the Amazon for two years and, and you got involved with uh, some indigenous people there and saw their resistance firsthand. And I was wondering what you learned from that experience. Well, the people I really learned for, from were not so much the indigenous people, though I learned plenty from them too, but the, the, the peasant activists in the northeast of Brazil, in the state of Maranhão, who were trying to prevent their land being stolen um, by this coalition of big landowners, um, local police, the, the federal police and the state. It was a horrendous bunch of people arrayed against them. But with this incredibly effective political mobilization, they succeeded. And uh, this was before the big um, land movement, the Movimento Sem Terra, um, kicked off in Brazil. The, these were some of the sort of first activists at that time. And and I found this a an incredibly inspiring movement. It was in many ways my political education, um, and and I came back from a couple of years in, in Brazil, feeling I understood my own politics for the first time. I came back to Britain and thought, oh, now I see what's happening, and now I see what needs to be done. And and what did need to be done there? In in that case, you know, I, I began to see that what I'd been witnessing in Brazil. Um, was what had happened in Britain a couple of hundred years before, that basically a bunch of big guys had come and taken all the land and taken all the resources, and that people had fought them, but in the case of Britain, they had lost. And ever since then, we'd been struggling against this profound political and economic inequality caused by that historical land theft, which gave rise to so much else that went wrong, and that we'd been shut out through what at the time was called enclosure. The enclosure of the land actually had far wider ramifications than just the enclosure of the land. It was the enclosure of all sorts of power, political, um, cultural and social power, um, uh, concentrated into the hands of a very small group of people and others shut out. And, and that reclaiming that power meant pulling down the virtual fences. It meant a, a democratic revival which would enable us once more to have a fair share of um, the resources both tangible and intangible which had been denied to us. Well just to end off I mean it can be hard to imagine a, a way forward or what, what the future could actually look like where we get off this treadmill of both consumption and taking more and more from the world and as you mentioned, both the capitalistic system and, and communism both used fossil fuels and, and weren't exactly great for the earth either. Uh, through, through the conversation, it seems that a lot of what you're saying is that we need a change in philosophy. And then maybe from there, we can start to build a, a positive future. I, I was wondering, like, how do you envision uh, a future or how specific can you get? Because, yeah, as I mentioned, it, it can seem, it can seem ha hard to, to see where we might be going. Well, what we don't want is some all-encompassing all encompassing utopia, which is designed from the outset, where all the questions are answered. Um, we've seen all too many times what happens when, when you try to create something like that. What we do want is a system which can keep changing. It's just like in a relationship. It's your ability to change is what keeps that relationship healthy, that you can just keep moving on and evolving and developing. And at the moment, in countries like ours, we're in a situation of arrested development where we can't really change our situation. We can't really change the trajectory on which we are. And that's because 
democracy isn't functioning properly. Um, so the democratic revival, usurping corporate power, the financial power, which has stopped democracy from working properly, bringing back the centers of power to the places where we can vote people in or out, that is absolutely essential prerequisite to any of the changes that we want to see happen. And that then enables societies to evolve and develop as they wish to do. Um, so what I don't want to do is to say, this is how society should be in 2050, and this is how you should be living and I should be living, and this is the sort of um, idea of social organization I've got. I want to say, this is how we need to start if we're going to get to whatever it is we might want by that date. We need to start now with a democratic revival. And so would you say to ordinary people concerned about climate change and sustainability, I mean, we can we can just start even at our community level with democratic revival, like as long uh, as we start taking those first few steps that we're, we're on our way? I would say the first thing is don't rely on the media to do um, to, to do your outreach for you. You've got to do your own outreach and you've got to reframe the questions so that they actually um, create a wider view of the world and its problems and its potential solutions than the one that we are fed by the media. That is the first essential step. You are in possession of the most powerful medium of all, which is word of mouth, and you have to use that. But in before using it, you had to stand back and say, what am I seeing and what am I not seeing here? What am I being induced to focus on and what am I missing as a result of that? Well, you certainly have done a great job at uh, reframing things and uh, doing exactly that through your columns over the years. And uh, it's been instructive and, and enlightening to read. George Mambio, thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks very much, Kevin. A real pleasure. That was my conversation with journalist and columnist George Mambio. And if you're not already a regular reader of his weekly column in The Guardian, I highly recommend it. And that's all for The Elephant this time. The Elephant is made by myself, Kevin Kaners, along with Matthias Gutz and Christina Peters. And it's made with support from the Climate Kick Alumni Association. It's a community of entrepreneurs and young professionals working on creating a climate resilient society. You can find out more at ckaa.eu. We're online at elephantpodcast.org, and you can follow us on Facebook or on Twitter. Our handle is at elephantpodcast. And if you like the show, be sure to recommend it. I'm Kevin Kaners. See you soon.